Mark, Mark Rosenstein, who has been a huge help to the Alliance and done four programs. This is his fourth, I believe. I remember coral reefs and birds in your backyard, but there's one I've forgotten. And this one, butterflies. Ah, thank you. Um, anyway, Mark is really an expert photographer, naturalist, and he is a huge help with our technical problems, as you can see many of us need. Anyway, Mark, it's wonderful to have you here on this snowy day to cheer us up. So welcome. Um, so I'm actually, I'm just an amateur naturalist. I have no formal training in it, but it's something I enjoy very much and doing nature photography while I'm out there as well. Um, let me see if I can share my desktop and there. Um, so today I'm gonna um, talk about a naturalist year, which is just going over for every season, there's always something interesting to see, even in the middle of winter, and certain things that only happen at certain times of year that if you know about, you can see. Um, the, this talk will be heavily biased towards um, birds, um, but I, I will talk about other stuff as well. And people sometimes ask about that. E among all the naturalists I've met, even people who specialize in various kinds of insects or reptiles and other animals, everyone seems to be a birder. And part of the reason for that is birds are easier to see than most other animals. Um, at any time of year, I can go out and see birds. If you challenge me to go, you wanted to see um, furry mammals. They're just much harder to see. Um, it, 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 as soon as you want to see something beyond squirrels and chipmunks and such. Um, so that's why so many people are into birding. It's kind of the easiest form of naturalist to be. Um, anyway, so talking about the year, starting in January, one of the highlights to me of the winter months are snowy owls. Um, so the picture you see here um, was taken up in Plum Island which is up in Newburyport on the coast and nor northern part of Massachusetts. Um, snowy owls live much of the year um, up on the, the tundra in northern Canada. But when it's winter there, they come down here because they consider our winters warm. <laughs> so they're only around here in the winter. Um, this one really stands out because there's no snow on the ground, but imagine it was sitting in a snowy field, they'd be almost impossible to see. And um, they're actually fairly large owls and are very much a top predator. Um, someone I know who works with them has seen a snowy owl take down a peregrine falcon. They are, <clears throat> can be fearsome birds. Um, they probably stand about two feet high. If you've watched the Harry Potter movies, Harry's owl is the snowy owl. All of that one is mostly CGI rather than a live owl. Anyway, moving on, something else that's good in the winter and today is a perfect day for this is tracking. I've only done a little bit of it, but fresh snow is one of the easiest ways to see animal tracks. Um, so this picture, there's four footprints in the middle, two large ones in front, are on the right side and two smaller ones on the left side. These are tracks of a gray squirrel. Um, so I, I say I've done a little bit of tracking. There, there's a lot to learn to be any good at it. Um, <clears throat> so like rabbit tracks and squirrel tracks look very similar. The differences there are pretty subtle, but tracking, it's all about the pattern of the prints as well as the size and shape of them. Also the size, the main difference between the cottontail tracks and the squirrel tracks is the size. They both use a similar bounding motion. Um, but yeah, if you ever wanna try tracking right after a light snow in midwinter is probably the easiest time. Doing it in summer, you have to find muddy patches to look for prints. It becomes a lot harder. Um, 
there are a number of birds around that are only here in the winter. Um, this is called a snow bunting. And um, it's a sparrow. They're actually somewhat related to our common house sparrows, but um, they're mostly white with a few brown and gray patches, and uh, they blend in the snow pretty well. And um, <clears throat> they show up in um, late fall, early winter, and are often here through the winter. So another reason to get out even in midwinter. And then, of course, some people are like, oh, I don't want to go out and hike in midwinter. <clears throat> There's a saying, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing choices. I don't entirely agree with that, but certainly if you prepare, um, spending a day out hiking in midwinter isn't that bad. Um, something else that's good around here in midwinter um, that I will often look for in February, or January, February, are sea ducks. There are a number of ducks that will winter down here that summer further north in the Arctic. Um, this one is a long-tailed duck, although um, he's not holding his tail up for you to, to see that, <laughs> the namesake part of that. Um, th there's probably 30 different kinds of ducks that can be found in Massachusetts, and some of them are only here in the, uh, the winter. Um, another of these ducks that's primarily here in the winter, that's also a sea duck. Um, this, this is a um, harlequin duck um, shot off the coast of Gloucester a couple of years ago. Um, so some of these are much more interesting in appearance than the common mallards that you may be familiar with and um, something to look for in the winter. Bald eagles. Um, used to be primarily here in the winter. Um, some now spend um, year-round time in Massachusetts, but up in Newburyport and Salisbury, in mid-February every year, they actually have an eagle festival and invite people up there. They'll be experts with spotting scopes in a number of places that are well publicized to help people see eagles. Um, and I, I've had, um, 10 or 12 eagles on a day there. Um, so this is an eagle soaring, a pair sitting in a tree together. Um, <clears throat> yeah, when I started birding, it was really only in winter. Now on the Mystic Lakes between Arlington and Medford, um, you can often see eagles year round. They're becoming more, more common, but winter is probably still an easier time to see them. Um, this is a red-winged blackbird, a bird that may be familiar to a um, number of people because they can be pretty easy to see. They are one of the earliest migrants to show up. Um, so this is a male. The males are black with the, the red shoulder patch. Um, the females are streaky drab brown, look very different. And the males will show up in March. The females are about a month behind them. Um, the males are all trying to stake out territory and want to be the first one to show up is, is why they come so much earlier. <clears throat> but it's it's a sign that winter is going to break and spring is coming when the blackbirds show up. Um, another fairly early migrant bird to show up also in March um, <clears throat> are uh, Phoebes. This is a, uh, a small flycatcher. And will also show up um, more to mid to late March. <clears throat> but um, again, it's an early migrant of a bird that will spend all the summer months here. Um, <clears throat> about this time, as, as everything is warming up and um, the ground isn't so frozen, one of the first plants to appear is skunk cabbage. And when they initially sprout, they look something like this. Um, in damp areas, it's common to see these coming up in mid-March mid as well. Um, signs of spring. Um, one of my favorite spring phenomenons, um, this photo is not mine, by the way. I've not managed to photograph one of these. Um, this bird is called an American woodcock, although some people call them timber doodles. Um, so it's, a, it's the same family as shorebirds. But um, you don't find these at the beach. They live 
kind of at the edge where woods come to damp meadows. So um, Rock Meadow in Belmont probably has them. It's not a place I've generally gone to see them. But starting in late March and continuing through April and sometimes through the beginning of May, um, nearly every night they do um, a courtship dance, which I find fascinating. I try to get out at least once every spring to see it. Um, to, to see it, you need to be out in one of their areas um, shortly before sunset. So like at that time of year, sunset might be at say 6.30, 6.40. I would try and be in place by, by 6.15 or a little after that. Um, find a quiet place to stand near the edge of a wet meadow that borders woods. And eventually you'll start hearing pee, pee. And the birds will call like that every five or 10 seconds for a while. And then after a couple of minutes, um, <clears throat> they fly up in a big spiral pattern. So they'll fly in circles 100 feet around um, and spiral up several hundred feet, continuing to make the, that painting call. And also there's a, a whistle that their wings make. Um, they have special feathers on their wings that make a whistling sound as they fly like that. And they spiral up and then spiral back down even faster while also making chirping noises. <clears throat> and um, it's just kind of fascinating to watch. But of course, by the time they're doing this, it's getting dark. Um, this, the sun has just set and you can barely make them out. This is why I've never managed to photograph it. But it, it, it's still fun to be there and watch and, and hear. You mostly hear it, but sometimes you can see them as well. So to me, that's a, a highlight of spring. Um, something else that happens in early spring, as soon as there's an, an evening where the nighttime temperature um, is into the upper 50s or 60, um, a lot of salamanders will be on the move. Um, they overwinter in the leaf litter at the bottom of larger ponds and lakes, but they wanna lay eggs in vernal pools. Um, vernal pools are temporary ponds that only form in the spring from ice and snow melt and will disappear by early summer. So the, all of these um, salamanders and newts will do a migration of hundreds of feet, maybe a half mile or, or a mile to find a place to, a vernal pool to go lay their eggs. Um, they're actually volunteers who are on the night when this is likely to start, um, try and slow traffic down at certain places where a lot of them tend to cross roads because it's very dangerous for them in modern areas. Um, the one in the picture here is an um, Eastern spotted newt. This was one I found, we were up, to, up in New Hampshire at the time. I've seen them in Massachusetts as well. Um, oops. Oh, sorry, this doesn't want to advance the slide. What's going on? There we go. Um, so something else in very early spring, um, typically the beginning of April when there's an afternoon with the temperature um, up into the 60s and sunny, the first butterflies of the year will appear. Um, this one is a morning cloak. It's a butterfly that spends winter as an adult. Um, while the top side is this rich burgundy color with blue spots, the back side is a streaked brown. And they'll just um, stand on a tree trunk, wedging partway into a, um, a little fissure in the uh, bark. And they're almost invisible like that. And they will spend winter that way um, as adults just hanging out on a tree trunk. But as soon as there's a warm, sunny afternoon, <clears throat> they reappear and start sunning themselves. There's a couple other butterflies that do that as well, but this is probably the most well-known. Um, most butterflies overwinter as um, eggs or chrysalis. So those don't appear until much later because it takes much more time for them to become adults and fly. Um, 
Also, once all the ice is gone and the water is warming up, um, this is a muskrat. There are a number of animals that hibernate over the winter. Um, and it's at this point in the spring that they start waking up and appearing. Um, muskrats, they're called rats. They are a, a rodent, but they're, um, they live in marshes and swamps. And um, I actually think they're cute. I see them with some regularity when I'm birding in the spring, swimming around. Um, this one was probably shot and conquered at Great Meadows. <clears throat> um, in By mid-April, the um, great blue herons are already starting to nest. And um, it's always interesting to visit a heron rookery. Um, a rookery is where herons nest together. They often do this in large groups. Um, you don't find just a single heron nest. Um, this was shot out in Littleton, Mass. If you drive out Route 2 just before you get to 495, you can see a wet area on the left if you're heading out away from Boston. Um, that's where this was shot. I was on foot from the other side of that marsh. Um, most heron rookeries are in trees that are growing out of marshes. <clears throat> that by choosing trees coming out of water, it protects the nests from some of the animals that would otherwise raid the nests. That um, raccoons and animals like that aren't going to swim across the marsh to climb the tree to try and steal eggs. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with great blue herons, these are big birds. They stand more than three feet tall. So <laughs> this shot is from a long way off because I didn't want to wade into the marsh. Um, but it's not unusual to see a dozen or more nests together. Um, in fact, if you look at the left-hand nest, you can just make out the head of a bird sitting on that, as well as the one standing on the nest closer to the middle of the picture. Um, also, in, in mid-April, the first um, of the warblers appear. Warblers are a group of birds that um, a lot of people who are in, into birding consider some of the most interesting birds. They're brightly colored. Um, they're very active. They have interesting songs. And for the most part, they're only seen for a few weeks in the spring. So people who are into birding get excited when they show up and spend a lot of time birding in late April and through May, and then you don't see as many warblers through the rest of the year. Um, this one here is a yellow rump warbler, which is one of the early warblers to show up. And um, they can be here in great numbers for a couple of weeks. Um, so even where I live in Cambridge, which is a pretty dense suburban neighborhood, um, it's not unusual to see, so, see them in the trees in our yards moving through during, during uh, the second half of April. <clears throat> also at this point, um, reptiles that have spent the, uh, <clears throat> the winter hiding in a den over up here, this is Northern water snake. Um, <clears throat> they like to sun themselves to warm up on sunny, sunny mornings. Um, I think I saw this one also at Concord Great Meadows. Um, there aren't a lot of snakes in Massachusetts, and for the most part, um, poisonous snakes are almost never seen. So I'm not afraid of snakes. Um, in fact, almost all the snakes I've ever seen here have been these water snakes or garter snakes. Um, and I always find it interesting to see different kinds of creatures. So seeing a snake coil like this by the side of the trail to me is an exciting thing to stop and observe. As we move to the end of, um, where are we? We're in April. Um, more and more warblers appear. Um, this is a yellow warbler. <clears throat> um, yes, it's yellow colored, but it's actually called yellow warbler as well. Um, it would be a male. You can tell from the, um, <clears throat> the orange streaks on the breast. And um, a lot of different warblers start coming through at this time of year. Um, this one is a black and white warbler. And that's, this one 
is a uh, palm warbler. <clears throat> um, so they all tend, many of them are strongly patterned and colorful. Um, they all have distinctive, interesting songs, which all the males will be singing at this time of year because they're getting ready to go nest nesting. So um, you can find them by listening for the uh, songs if you've learned to recognize them. Um, they're pretty small birds, but um, I, I do find them fascinating. And through like the last week in April and the first few weeks of May, I often try to get out every morning. Um, Mount Auburn Cemetery is actually a really good place to see them. A lot of birders go there, but other places in the area um, can be good. Almost anywhere with um, a decent canopy of large native trees, you're likely to find warblers passing through them. Um, other migrants are coming through at this point also. Um, this is a Baltimore Oriole. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the warblers aren't the only brightly colored birds. Um, the Orioles are hard to miss and they also have a beautiful song. Um, and the Orioles will stay here for the summer. Some of the warblers do as well. They're just harder to see after migration than they are while they're migrating. Um, but um, yeah, Orioles are actually all over. When they first show up and they're singing, they can be really obvious. Later in the year, they, they are also much harder to see. Um, as we get into early May, butter, more and more butterflies start appearing. Um, this butterfly is a pine elfin. Um, it's a butterfly of early spring. It basically only flies during during May. Um, this one, I believe I was down at uh, Miles Standish State Park in, um, where is that, Carver, Mass. <clears throat> so south of Boston is where I saw this. Um, I tend to go down there early spring every year because it's a good spot to see several of the early butterflies that appear. Um, another early butterfly, this one is silvery blue, um, named for the color of the uh, upper side of the wings. Um, usually a good place to see this is, is more west in um, Hudson, Mass. Um, there's a area called the Delaney, uh, well, it's not a wildlife refuge, it's the Delaney Water Management Area. There's a reservoir and a dam and, and floodplains around there. And it's a good place to see a lot of wildlife. And um, <clears throat> so I often go there in May as well, looking for some of the early butterflies. And it's a good place to find this particular one. Um, it's, it's a pretty small butterfly, as you might guess from seeing the grass that it, <laughs> it's sitting on. But um, the, while it's flying, you can see the flashes of the silvery blue color, which is really nice. As we get into later May, um, a lot of the birds start nesting. And with that behavior, a lot of them become much more difficult to see. Um, this picture is a, of a chickadee, a black-capped chickadee, which happens to be the state bird of Massachusetts. Um, and chickadees are cavity nesters. They will readily take to birdhouses if you put up a birdhouse. Um, but birds that call loudly at much of the year and, and fly around not being so afraid of people, when you get into nesting season, they don't want anyone, people or other animals, or often even other birds to know where their nests are. So they become very secretive, um, making them harder to see. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as a naturalist, if you spend enough time looking, you can find birds on the nest. This one is a mockingbird. <clears throat> um, yeah, mockingbirds have long tails and this poor one <laughs> tail is sticking up because of the way it has to fit into the nest. Um, <clears throat> one of the birds that's actually fairly easy to see during nesting time are robins. Um, 
they can nest in a lot of places. This one's on the front of a building, but um, I've seen them in shrubs at eye level in places that are actually quite obvious. So it's a little unusual that they, they don't mind nesting in places that are easily seen like that. Um, I've had them on the outside of our house on top of a security light and on shrubbery in front of a window <laughs> where we had a really good view. Um, <clears throat> a nest that's particularly hard to find. I didn't find this one on my own. Um, someone else pointed it out to me. So this is a hummingbird, ruby-throated hummingbird on a nest that's maybe an inch across. The nest is made of moss and lichens. <clears throat> Tiny little thing, the humming, hummingbird couple assemble the nest and then she's gonna sit in the nest for several weeks. Um, these are Eastern kingbirds. Um, another bird that's a migrant that only summers here. Um, although if you look, what the bird that appears to be sitting on the nest is actually a recent hatchling, or actually probably a fledgling at this point. Um, so a bit of terminology, hatchlings are birds that have hatched from the egg that are still um, nest bound, that have never left the nest. When a bird fledges, that means it's left the nest and flown for the first time. Um, for most species, um, hatchlings stay in the nest um, one to two weeks before they fledge. Um, and once the, the young birds fledge, they follow the parents around um, anywhere from another week to even a month or more, <clears throat> begging to be fed um, <laughs> till long after they should be capable of feeding themselves. They, <laughs> they'd rather have mom and dad bring them food, but um, and at this time of year, so we're, we're different species of birds um, nest at slightly different times, but like say in June, um, it's not unusual to see fledglings around and they can be tricky to figure out what they are if they're not with their parents, because a lot of fledglings don't look that much like the parents and they're kind of streaky and they're gangly and they don't fly well. Um, so like um, in this pair, these are hairy woodpeckers, um, fledgling on the right, one of the parents, um, this would be mom. Um, a lot of birds, it's, it's hard to tell if you're looking at a male or a female. In woodpeckers, the males always have red on their head and the females don't, or will have less red depending on the species. So I can tell this one is a female, presumably the mother of the, uh, other bird. Um, right, I found these over by the Mystic Lakes in Medford. Um, <clears throat> the, <laughs> the younger bird was just screeching piteously, basically going, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. Um, <clears throat> it's not unusual for fledglings to do that, and it's part of the reason a lot of birds don't survive to adulthood, because <laughs> mom is being very quiet, didn't want any potential predators to know they were there, and, and the baby is just screaming as loud as it can. But she came and fed him. Um, of course, at this time of year, the ducks and geese also have young. Um, so while a lot of the um, smaller birds, what are called passerines, um, you have fledglings that are completely help or nestlings that are completely helpless that eventually fledge and fly um, for waterfowl, for ducks and geese and swans. Um, within hours of hatching, they, they can swim and move around on their own. And um, they will follow mom around who will help them a lot the first few days and will still lead them around for for weeks or, or even a month, but they're not helpless the way the smaller birds are. Um, so this is a, a mallard and you may wonder that there are eight ducklings with her, that um, that's a lot of 
ducklings or one mom. It turns out it's not unusual, especially in mallards, but in some other ducks as well, that some parents dump their, their children on other parents. <clears throat> so you end up with a few super moms that may be leading a dozen or more chicks, only um, four or five of which are hers. And that's just what happens in ducks. <laughs> Um, so it's an example of how the uh, fledglings don't necessarily look like their parents. This is an American robin. I, I showed you earlier a um, adult sitting on the nest, but the, the fledgling is more streaky. There's not a definitive. The adult would be a slate gray back with a rusty breast, um, all fairly fairly clean, solid colors with just a few um, bold white lines. <clears throat> the fledgling is kind of mottled and streaky. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, if you don't know what the fledglings look like, it can be hard to figure out what they are. Um, I think most of them tend to be streaky like that because it's easier for them to hide. Um, if this one was quiet and hunkered down in the... Um, <clears throat> the leaf litter and straw there, it would be hard to see. But of course, a lot of them aren't good at being quiet. Um, this I found particularly noteworthy. We were canoeing in um, Ip the Ipswich River up in Ipswich, Massachusetts. And again, I spotted these because they were making a lot of noise, begging to be fed. These are um, hatchling pileated woodpeckers, one of the larger birds in the area. Um, this is what the adult looks like. So this is a woodpecker that's probably 18 inches tall. <clears throat> it's a big bird and I don't see them very often. So it's always exciting to see one. And I, he I heard these making a lot of noise, spotted them in the hole in the tree. And while watching one of the one of the parents came to feed them is how I knew what they were. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been sure what type of woodpecker they were. <clears throat> so now as we, we get into mid to, to late June, summer is really setting in. Um, more and more insects are about as well. Um, dragonflies are something I always like to watch. And um, this one is an ebony jewel wing, which I think is particularly pretty. Um, with the, this iridescent turquoise color, as, as they fly, you see it, even more of the turquoise, although both sides of the wings are black. Um, <clears throat> but these are often on uh, <clears throat> small shrubs that along the shores of uh, <clears throat> slow moving streams and such, and um, are interesting to see. Also at this time of year, um, around various marshes. Um, more and more reptiles have been appearing. This one's a spotted turtle. Um, most people are probably familiar with the more common turtle seen around here has a dark shell and red marks on the sides of the head. Um, that's actually a, called a painted turtle. Um, <clears throat> but I, I particularly like the spotted turtle with all the yellow sp spots on it. And this was seen down in Milton in um, uh, what's the, um, Foul Meadow is the name of that place. It's a, a more conservation land down there. As we get to the end of June and early July, <clears throat> local wild blueberries ripen. And this is always a treat for me if, if I'm hiking and see blueberry bushes. I, I will pluck some of the blueberries to eat. Um, just as a snack while hiking, I wouldn't try and harvest large numbers to take home because a lot of wildlife depends <clears throat> on the blueberries, but I can't resist a, a treat from that. Um, so as we get in towards midsummer, um, more and more butterflies and moths are around. And mothing 
is um, something else I'm into. Um, a lot of people may think a lot of moths are just kind of um, gray and, and uninteresting, but there's actually a lot out there, uh, a huge variety of moths. While there's about 100 different kinds of butterflies in Massachusetts, there's probably 8,000 different kinds of moths, and some of them are quite spectacular. Um, this picture is actually on the back porch of my friend's place up in Vermont. Um, but I, I've um, done similar things. In fact, I do this on our porch in Cambridge where we don't get a whole lot because it's not a very wild area. Um, but like there's someone in Athole, Mass, who every year holds an event called the Mothball where he invites naturalists out to his place and he's in a very wild area in, in the woods and they will string up lights and just get hundreds or thousands of different kinds of moths. Um, so some of what shows up, um, right, I'm not good at the names of these offhand, um, right, this one is a moss eater. And um, so this pale green color, if it, if it were perched on moss, you'd never see it on the wood siding of the house, it's kind of obvious. Um, this one's a crocus geometer. Um, this one's maybe inch and a half, two inches across, brightly colored and patterned. Um, this one is a, it's called a raspberry pyrasta. Um, I don't, it doesn't eat raspberries, it's named for the color, but um, I've had these on my porch in Cambridge and, and seen them a number of places. Um, I like the pink color there. Um, this is Lacan's haploa. This one's pretty small, but has an interesting pattern. Um, a highlight for me is uh, very occasionally when I'm out looking for moths, I'll see some of the greater silk moths. Um, so the, this is a family of moths. There's four or five of them in New England, um, members of this family. This one is called a polyphemus moth. It's a Wingspan is probably five inches. It would fill your palm if one landed on your hand. And it has these false eye spots. Um, I find these beautiful. And another of the silk moths is called a luna moth. Um, this one is probably only a four inch wingspan, but it has these graceful tails that hang down. Um, most of them do have false eye spots, which are just there to confuse predators who might think they're looking at the face of a large animal. Um, both both these photos were taken in Vermont, but I've also seen both these species in Massachusetts as well. Um, and at this time, of course, there are lots of butterflies out there as well. Um, these are tiger swallowtails. Um, most people have probably only seen these fly by. They spend a lot of their time in the tops of trees. Um, not so often where they're easy to see. But something a lot of butterflies do, it's called puddling. Um, they'll find a place where there's damp mud or sandy soil that's rich in certain minerals that they need. And they'll go down there and lick the ground to get the minerals they need. That They just instinctively know <laughs> they need these vitamins. And um, if you find the right place, you can find large groups of them just sitting on the ground licking it like that. Um, I think these were shot in Ashburnham, somewhere in Central Mass. <clears throat> um, this butterfly is um, called the Baltimore Checker Spot. I don't recall where I photographed this particular one, but he also appears to be puddling. Um, <laughs> I'd like to photograph them while they're doing this because it it's a time and place when you can get much closer to them. They're more cooperative for photos than when they're flying around or nectaring. Um, so something that happens at this time of year is um, called the 4th of July butterfly counts. Um, oh, what's the organization? Uh, NABA, the North American Butterfly Association is one of the sponsors of this. Um, what this map is showing, each of these circles 
is a place where there's a formal butterfly count. Um, it's an organized event um, done with volunteers. And there are several hundred across North America places where people do this, always within a couple of weeks of the 4th of July, which is part of why they're called the 4th of July counts. Um, I've participated in both the Concord one, um, the one in Wooster, and the one up in um, Essex County. And um, it's <clears throat> the way they typically work. Um, you re we recruit volunteers through clubs and email announcements and lists where naturalists hang out. Um, we'll all meet somewhere, often at someone's house or a nature center. And <clears throat> the circles are about 15 miles across. And the count organizer will divide all the volunteers up into teams and um, assign them to, to go to likely places within the circle and see what butterflies they can find, um, identify everything they can, and count how many individuals are seen. Um, and typically, I would spend maybe um, five or six hours doing this with often two or three other people. Um, usually, the volunteers would all meet back somewhere for, for lunch at midday. And it, by mid to late afternoon, there's a, um, we'd all get back together and compile the results. <clears throat> Basically, compare what people saw and get, make totals for the circle. And it's not unusual to record 40 different kinds of butterflies and seven or 800 individuals seen. And this is compiled across the country and long-term statistics are drawn from it. So no, no one thinks we're counting every butterfly seen in North America, but by counting in the same spot every year and following a particular method of counting that's described in detail, um, there's a lot of useful information that can be learned about population dynamics and from that, um, scientists can estimate how many butterflies there really are. <clears throat> so this is something I always do um, in early July every year. It's uh, I find really interesting. So I mentioned at the beginning, there's a lot about birds here, but there certainly are other animals around. Um, probably everyone knows Eastern chipmunks. Um, and eastern gray squirrel, probably the mammals that are most well um, used to hanging around people in our houses and such. There are plenty of other animals around. They're just much harder to see. Um, so this is an American porcupine. I've seen two alive and three is roadkill. Is all I've ever seen of them in all the time I've spent in the field. So they're not common by any means, but they are out there. Out there, This one was seen in Vermont. Um, in Massachusetts, I've only ever seen them as roadkill, which is very sad, but I'm sure they're around. They're just hard to spot. Um, White-tailed deer um, actually are not that hard to spot in certain places. I've even seen them in Cambridge. They're certainly at Rock Meadow and a lot of other places. Um, possums are not common, but this one I saw in Cambridge. <laughs> and um, it's something you're probably as likely to see digging through your trash as hanging out somewhere more wild. Um, same for raccoons. <laughs> um, part of the reason that most municipalities strongly encourage trash cans with locking lids it's because raccoons have learned to live around people and think nothing of digging through your trash. Um, they're actually quite smart. And um, yeah, I don't see them that often in the wild. They're pretty good at evading people. This one was snoozing in the tree, but woke up when I saw it <laughs> and didn't stay there too long. Um, I mentioned drag dragonflies earlier. Through midsummer is probably the best time to see dragonflies. 
And there are probably 60 or 70 different kinds of dragonflies that can be seen in Massachusetts. Um, this is one of the larger and more spectacular ones called a 12 spotted skimmer. It's probably got a wing span of maybe four inches. And I've seen them in a number of places. This one was probably photographed at Martin Burns Wildlife Management Area, which is up in Byfield, Mass. Um, moving on into August. <clears throat> so I talked about bird migration earlier, mainly in terms of um, songbirds, the smaller birds that you typically see in woods and trees and such. Shorebirds have their own migration. Um, in the spring, northbound shorebird migration, um, it, there is not much to see. Most of them, they're extremely long distance migrants who might fly a thousand miles nonstop. So um, they don't stop a lot in the spring on the way north. However, southbound shorebird migration starts in August, it's much earlier than it is for other birds. And the southbound migration is much slower and they stop in a lot of places. And um, shorebirds can congregate in great numbers, so it can be quite a spectacle as well. Um, this is one that if you've spent time at beaches, you've probably seen, this is a sanderling. Um, they run in and out with um, the waves looking for, uh, things that are uncovered by moving water in the sand. Um, this one is a least sandpiper. So it's the smallest of the sandpipers and it's probably only three inches long, little tiny thing. Um, <clears throat> these guys tend to hop on rocks and other things while they're feeding. Um, not all sandpipers are on beaches. Um, so, of course, much earlier in the talk, I talked about woodcocks, which are like wet meadows. Um, this one is, is a buff-breasted sandpiper, and they're found in grassy areas. Um, some people, ref there's probably five or six different kinds of sandpipers that prefer grass to sand, and <laughs> birders often refer to them as grass pipers, um, which is not a formal term, but just a way to to mention that group of, of birds. Um, this is another one that's um, not seen on um, uh, the beaches and the ocean shores. This is actually a, in a pond. This um, was probably shot at Blair Pond in Cambridge. Um, this is a solitary sandpiper. And um, yeah, they're found inland on mud, typically around uh, lakes and ponds or slow streams. <clears throat> As we get to late August and early September, um, another group of birds that migrate through are nighthawks. Um, <clears throat> they're not truly hawks at all. Um, hawks are a family of birds that are all related and have um, share a, a common anatomy and, and shape. Nighthawks are a different group entirely and not really shaped much like regular hawks either. Um, the, the name nighthawk, they do hunt primarily at night. Um, if you look at kind of the orange tint on his body here, that's because I shot this at sunset, which is about when they start flying. Um, and they will continue for a, an, an hour or two past sunset as well. Um, these guys eat primarily flying insects. So you may know that um, you're most likely to get bitten by mosquitoes at dawn or dusk is when they're most active. Birds that like to eat them tend to hunt at dawn and dusk. <laughs> um, but um, the nighthawks primarily are looking for larger insects than mosquitoes, but they would probably eat those too. <clears throat> but um, that's something that I often make an effort to see during their fall migration. I sometimes see them in spring migration as well, um, which is in April, but they're harder to spot going north than when they're going south. 
And speaking of migration, most people probably know that monarch butterflies migrate. There are other butterflies that migrate as well. These are called painted ladies. Um, and um, they don't migrate as far as a lot of others. These probably move from the mid-Atlantic up into New England each year and back. But um, this was shot on Gooseberry Island, which is down in Westport, Mass, right on, on the edge of uh, Buzzards Bay. And in, um, they don't form up like this every year, but some years as they're getting ready to migrate, um, tens or hundreds of thousands of them will gather at places like this to migrate together. Um, so in this shot, if you look carefully, I think there are more than a dozen of these butterflies here uh, perched and nectaring on the goldenrod. And, and it can be quite the spectacle when you do find groups forming up like this for their migration. Um, <clears throat> I do pay attention to beetles and other smaller insects. Um, well, I'm not good at identifying them, but but one that I find spectacular that appears in September. This is called um, a locust borer. Um, presumably, at some point in its life, it must bore holes into locust trees, given that name. I don't know its whole life cycle. But in September, they're often seen feeding on goldenrod. And um, I, I just like the pattern on them. And it's a decent sized beetle, probably half to three quarter inch long. Um, so also in September, the, the songbirds that migrate um, start their southbound migration. Um, so I talked a lot of, about um, the warblers during their northbound migration that they sing so you can find them and they're all, all brightly colored and patterned. These same birds, when they're heading south, are no longer in their breeding colors. They're not singing because they're not trying to court um, other birds to mate together. And so they're all kind of drab and harder to see, harder to identify. This is another yellow warp, war yeah, sorry yellow rumped warbler. I showed one of those earlier, which was very distinctly colored. In the fall, they're kind of drab with just hints of yellow. And I actually find it really challenging during fall migration to figure out what I'm looking at, because a lot of the birds just aren't as distinctive. However, during the fall is a good time to look for sparrows. Um, when you people who aren't serious birders, when they hear sparrows, probably think of the house sparrows that are common in a lot of people's yards and tend to mob their feeders. There's probably 15 different kinds of sparrows seen in Massachusetts. And, um, the, the common house sparrow that so many that are in so many people's yards is actually an invasive that was brought over here from Europe. And it's done amazingly well and threatens a number of native species. <clears throat> the other sparrows that I like looking for in the fall are native sparrows. The one in this picture is called a white crown sparrow. Um, <laughs> you might wonder at the name in the spring when it's in mating colors, there's a bright white stripe on the crown. In, in the fall, it, it's, it's drabber and, and brown, but um, these birds are more often seen in the fall than, than the spring. This was shot at Dennehy Park here in Cambridge, which is actually a pretty good place for, for fall sparrows that often lead a series of walks there for the local bird club. Um, this one is Lincoln Sparrow. Um, Sparrows are kind of advanced for birders because a lot of them are streaky and people think they look similar. It's taken me a lot of time to learn to recognize the differences between them, but now I would look and say, oh yeah, that's a Lincoln Sparrow because it's a buffy tan color underneath um, thin dark stripes 
or dark streaks, whereas some of the other more common sparrows, oh, the, the streaks are broader, fuzzier, and they're brown, and there's a lot of subtleties to look for. <laughs> but um, just know that there are fall sparrows to look for. Something else that happens as we get into fall is that um, <clears throat> as the leaves fall, um, nests that had been in use that summer become much more obvious. And as much as I think I pay attention to the bird life around my house, every year I'm surprised to discover nests in, in the yard that I was never aware of during nesting season, that it's only with the leaves falling they become obvious. Um, this one's a simple cup nest. It may have been from an American robin, but there are a number of other birds that make a nest like that. And as fall is rolling in, there are, um, there's a group of birds among birders referred to as winter finches. Um, these are mostly members of the finch family, although not all, that spend most of their time in the boreal forests of northern Canada. But some years, if the crop of pine cones and acorns isn't good up in that forest, they will venture further south looking for food. And this almost always happens in winter. And, and it's birders are often excited when these birds show up. This one is called a common red pole. And it's a bird that's not seen every year, but some years there can be huge numbers of them. If um, red poles, I think, feed on birch catkins. So the um, after birch trees flower, the, there are these little seed pods they form, and that's what these birds feed on. But if the birch crop isn't good in northern Canada, they will head south looking for food. Um, this one was probably shot at Dunback Meadow in Lexington. Um, another one of these winter finches. Um, this is a um, pine siskin. Um, so this is actually a finch, as was the previous one. Um, I'm not sure what pine siskins feed on, but occasionally there's a year where they're all over down here in the winter and other years where not a one is seen. <clears throat> there are no nomads like that. Um, this is a, another of the winter finches. I shot this on Tuesday. Um, this one is called a red crossbill. Um, <clears throat> if you look at the bill, you may notice the upper and lower mandibles, the points don't meet, they cross. Um, that's really unusual in birds. In most birds, it's, it would be a birth defect if you see that, but crossbills are all like that. And it tends to always be the way the top crosses the bottom left to right. They, they're always like that. And you may think it's a really odd and awkward shape. Crossbills have evolved like that they eat pine seeds. So that is the perfect shape for attacking the pine cones it's sitting on to, to um, pry apart the woody leaves of those cones to get to the seeds at the base of each leaf. <clears throat> and that's how they feed. Um, this year, we're getting a number of them down here. Um, not, they're not common by any means. Um, I was up at Salisbury Beach, where I saw these on Tuesday. But um, it must mean there's not a good pine cone crop in Northern Canada, so they've come south looking for food. Um, another bird that is seen pretty much every year here, but some years they're here in great numbers if they're not finding enough food further north. Um, this one is called a red-breasted nuthatch. It's not a... Uh, a finch at all, <clears throat> different family, um, right? There are places in central mass where they can be found pretty much every year, but some years they come down in great numbers out of Canada and then are found all over as far south as like Virginia even. Um, this is a bird that winters here every year. 
that usually shows up at some point in late fall or early winter. Um, it's called a horned lark. You can tell this was <laughs> seen in winter. It's on an icy um, area. That I've actually often seen them on mud or even parking lots. Um, they're looking for tiny grass seed that's blown around in the wind and will feed in places where you'd think there wouldn't be anything possibly edible. <clears throat> but um, yeah, I always find them an interesting bird as well. And kind of the end of my birding year on typical years. So I showed you a, a map similar to this earlier for where there are butterfly counts. Um, <clears throat> there are bird counts every year as well, referred to as the Christmas bird counts. Um, and the tradition of doing that is more than 100 years old. If you go back to the 1800s, um, there was a tradition, a lot of people on Christmas afternoon would go out with guns and shoot things. I, I don't remember now what that was called, but it was actually a common thing. People would go out and shoot squirrels or birds, whatever they could find. And the initial Christmas bird counts were started as a reaction to that, I think by some of the same um, people who founded the Audubon Society. And so the Christmas bird counts have been going on since the very early 1900s. Um, and it's a much bigger event than the butterfly counts in, in the midsummer, as you can tell there are many more circles here. And this is something I participate in every year as well. Um, and yeah, a lot more people get involved in it. And with more than 100 years of data, they can really um, chart population trends in birds. And you may wonder, why do it in winter? So yes, there's the origin story of trying to get people to quit shooting things on Christmas to instead just go count the wildlife. But this means you're not counting migrants. You're you're counting you're for the most part counting birds that are here all year. And there are a lot of birds that are here all year, as well as the the, the migrants. So you're not going to get any nesting birds counting at this time of year. But consistency in when and where you count is really important to be able to track the population trends. Um, I did this count. It was this Saturday day before Christmas this year was part of the team covering the town of Waltham. And we divided into four teams, I think, hit a bunch of different sites in, in Waltham. And um, it, it was a fun day to hang out with other naturalists and count birds. And I believe, yeah, that brings us to the end into my year and my talk. Cool, I kept it almost exactly an hour. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was very beautiful and informative, but beautiful <laughs> as well as informative. We're, I'm very grateful and I feel privileged to have had you show us these. Well, thank you. Are there any questions from anyone? People may need to unmute themselves if they want to ask questions. Well, um, Mark, I, I really appreciated uh, this review. It really was wonderful and wonderful photographs. Um, I was particularly struck by the, uh, the, the night hawk image. And it made me think of the uh, the other contributor to the elimination of mosquitoes, the uh, the the dragonfly, which is often called a a mosquito hawk, right. and, and, and bats as well. Yes, I also learned from Cy Montgomery recently that uh, why are bats like angels? They're both flying mammals. I found that pretty interesting. But um, in terms of the, the damselfly, it's not technically a dragonfly, is it? They're, they're just 
one of two groups that are right. related. So for people who study them, we often refer to them as odonates, which is the order that both dragonflies and damselflies belong to. They're very similar. Um, for those who don't know, I can probably find a photo real quick of a damselfly. And, and the damselfly has only two wings and kind of flies in a kind of wobbly manner, whereas the the dragonfly is very helicopter-like and and I think it can fly in reverse. Um, oh, they're amazing in how they fly. Yeah. Flies. Um, oh, why is it only sharing that? Sorry. Um, I thought it was going to be easy to start sharing. Okay, sharing. So that's kind of the typical damselfly. Mm -hmm. um, so it may look a lot different than the dragonfly I showed earlier, which has broad wings sticking out to the sides. But the um, the anatomy is almost the same. It's they just tend to hold their wings up over their back instead of out and have much thinner bodies. <clears throat> so yeah, they're they're very closely related, and I study both. Um, they're a real challenge to identify a lot of them. <clears throat> Often, the only way to be sure what you have is to catch it and in hand look at them under a magnifying glass. Wow. So it's part of why I started studying them, realized how difficult they were, and haven't continued to pursue dragonflies and damselflies as much just because I don't want to be that invasive to catch them to figure out what I'm looking at. Uh, the other thing about the dragonfly is that it uh, is a nymph for three years. And while in the water, it uh, eats the mosquito larva. So it has an advantage over the nighthawk in being able to work in two environments to, to uh, lessen the number of mosquitoes, which actually, you know, mosquitoes are responsible for about 70% of disease in the world. <laughs> Have you seen many different colors the dragonfly i've seen personally i don't know in this country but i've seen yellow i've seen blue i've seen green and some no color without colors there are also bright red ones yes 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 yeah um yes i i could do a whole talk on dragonflies i some people are squeamish about bugs so i decided not to put a lot of dragonflies into this talk and didn't think it would be a good topic for the group but yeah i actually do know quite a bit about dragonflies <laughs> they can also be tamed they they fit if you don't move uh very often they'll land on your hand yeah mark Gina, thank yeah. you so much you're such a font of information and i'm i was constantly writing down every time you mentioned another um location because you've put me on to a few um newer locations that i that i've been to and um and i you have been doing this for so long that i quickly googled the uh, uh littleton rookery and oh here was a whole directions for how to get the littleton rookery and i cut and pasted it into my notes and then I, you know, quickly glanced down and who was the source of the information? Mark Rosenstein <laughs> from, from 12 years ago. Wonderful. Oh. So, um, Mark, you, and your photos are outstanding. Here you are. You're down in the in the water and you're up in the air. Can you what what camera are you using for these outstanding photos? Because you, I, I know, are very sensitive about um keeping distance um uh, for for birding and so um i'm always curious as to the body and the lenses that you're using so this is what i shoot with um which is a this is a canon 7d mark ii so it's it's a digital slr camera um there it goes. <laughs> when i'm using it it opens up like this yeah um it's a 400 millimeter lens 
um, and it's got active image stabilization. So with a, with a lens like this, a small bird at 20, 25 feet, I can get decently large in the frame. Um, and I like this lens because it'll also focus really close down to, I can focus on something three feet from the end of it. And so something that's three feet away, like a dragonfly that's an inch long can fill mm -hmm. the frame. So I, I find this really versatile for both small insects as well as more skittish wildlife that won't let me get very close. And how because, heavy is that? Hmm? How heavy? Um, I, it's probably five or six pounds. Mm -hmm. it, it's somewhat heavy, but I've gotten used to whenever I hike, it's over my shoulder. And, and I'm just used to that now. And it doesn't bother me to, to spend all day hiking with it over my shoulder. And is that a Canon lens as well then? Yes. Yeah. The lens is from Canon as well as the camera. Um, this was really popular among naturalists um, like six or eight years ago. At this point, the body is, has been ob obsolete, replaced by something newer from Canon as well. I don't think there's a newer lens uh, with these specs. But the other thing that's been happening in the past four or five years, um, the whole camera industry is moving to a new format away from SLRs. Right. Um, the, the newer camera cameras work differently and I haven't made that jump yet. I might at some point, but I've invested a lot of money in cameras and lenses and it would cost me that much more to go to what the, the newest cameras are. And this mm -hmm. works well for me. So I'm not in a hurry to make that change, although it, someday I probably will. Well, you're doing beautiful photos. Thank you. On the computer, well, in terms of... Uh, Magnification, you know, we're familiar with times 10, times 20. What is the magnification on, on your camera? I find that question funny because those numbers mean nothing to me. What, what does times 10 mean when you're looking at something over there? 10 times what? I, I've never understood that. And professional cameras never use that kind of terminology. So I don't quite know how to answer it. <laughs> Mark, it's, uh, excuse me. this was a wonderful program. I myself, I'm not that much into birding, but I enjoy the birds who come to my bird feeder outside my window. And what those are always the same birds are coming. I have the blue jays, the slate-colored slate juncos, and then I also have the teenager and his wife. First, I thought those, this is probably the cardinal, but it isn't. It's a teenager. It looks very similar. And I wonder, is this a bird who is always only here in the winter time? I think it's the same couple there. They have every day and they eat seeds. And I see them right from my kitchen window. They're beautiful they're red. They look like a cardinal, but they have a different top. I mean, they don't have this. You know, like the cardinal, they have a little. Yeah. I think, hmm. Yeah. So I'm very curious what bird that is. I really doubt it's a tanager because tanagers are also migrants. Yeah. Uh, this is and wouldn't be here at this time of year. And they only feed on fruit. A tanager would not yeah. eat seeds. So, two reasons it's probably not a tanager. <laughs> I don't know what it would be then. Yeah, I, um, because if it's pretty much all red, um, yeah, this is interesting. They have, a, they don't have this little thing on top like the cat on has. So I thought it may be a different bird. Yeah, I. So this is interesting. Yeah, not but, all cardinals have a top actually. Yeah, well, yeah, they, they have a crest, but they can raise or lower it, and they mostly raise it again as a courtship thing. So at this yeah. time of year, yeah. they'd be less likely to raise it. Also, when it's cold, 
birds tend to clamp their feathers close to their body to stay warm. Oh, yeah. So it another may, reason, it might just be a cardinal who's not raising his crest. It may be the cardinal then. After yeah. All. yeah. You mentioned that you showed a, an oriole um, and it had it was red breasted. And the orioles I took pictures of in uh, uh, at Mount Auburn Cemetery were yellow orange breasted. Um, so the or the oriole I showed is mostly solid orange. The one with the red breast was a robin. No, no, no. I mean, really, uh, carmine, carmen. Okay. So there are two kinds of orioles that are expected in Massachusetts. There's the orchard oriole and the Baltimore oriole. The orchard oriole has a more rusty color, not as bright orange. Um, and very occasionally, so something I didn't really talk about um, are vagrants. Um, birds move around a lot, and very occasionally birds that aren't expected in an area will show up. Um, birds from the West Coast will somehow find their way here. Birds from South America that oh, okay. do a reverse migration will overshoot Central America and end up all the way up here. And that most often happens in our fall is when it's most common to, to see vagrants from other parts of the world. And um, every year, a handful of tanagers that aren't native to here show up. So it's possible, but not not real likely, but it's possible. <laughs> I, so I, I also wanted to thank you for just on this gray, snowy, rainy day to see these glorious, glorious pictures. And thank you for all the information you're imparting. So I had a question about the eagles. We've been searching for the eagles um, and haven't seen any. We had, I guess, last year we had seen some at uh, the Medford Dam at what, that you were talking about. And I know there was a nest there and maybe an Arlington Cemetery. There's an Arlington Cemetery that has some little pond, um, went to Spy Pond last weekend. But I wondered if, I mean, you can't order them up, but I wondered if there's a way, if you have any thoughts about where to see them this year, this season. So I saw two of them on Tuesday when I was up in Newburyport. Ah. And that's where they do the Eagle Festival in mid-February every year. They're pretty reliable up there. Okay. Um, they're often around here as well, but they're not as reliable. Um, I find if, if I go to Mystic Lakes looking for them, I see them maybe one time in three that I visit. I don't see them every time. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Mark? Yes. Am I unmuted? No. Yeah, yes, we can hear you. I am. Oh, good. My son in Shutesbury, which is out in Western Mass near Amherst, has feeds hummingbirds and has loads of hummingbirds that come to his house to eat this sugar mixture, whatever he puts in the feeders. Do you think that's okay that he's attracting, you know, yeah. 40 hummingbirds that probably are nesting there too? I'm sure some of them are. Um, yes, the, there used to be concern that um, just mix of, of sugar and water wasn't that healthy for them. Um, in more recent years, researchers have realized that hummingbirds also eat a significant number of flying insects. They're, they're getting protein and other things in their diet through catching insects. Um, I've seen them catch spiders. So they're not just drinking nectar. Mark, you talked about uh, the ducks as dumping their young ones on one unlucky uh, maybe female. But I was thinking that when I would see the, um, the gatherings of chicks of the uh, Canadian geese, that this was uh, a kind of uh, daycare center uh, where you know some would go off and find food and bring it back to the group and that maybe they rotated things, that, that they were doing a better job than humans at uh, childcare. Um, yeah, so geese are a little different than ducks in that regard. Um, 
if you see a, a group of geese feeding, you, there will always be one or two off to the sides with their heads held up really high. They're just watching for predators and will warn the others. And they kind of all take turns doing that. So geese are very cooperative in that way. I've not studied them enough to know just how their child rearing goes, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there is some of, of sharing of that. But like other waterfowl, the parents don't directly feed the, uh, the goslings. Mm -hmm. So it's not like the parents are bringing food back for them. The parents will show them where to eat, but they're not going to do like some birds where the parents will collect food and then regurgitate it for the really young ones or later bring back things and hand it directly to them. Um, that's not the way waterfowl feed. I see. I've had the privilege of uh, being welcome in several of the geese kindergartens <laughs> with my camera. So what they did is they were three or four adults and in the middle, there were goslings, really very small ones that were pecking on the ground and very quietly. Actually, I talked to them. I don't know what I did, but Kenneth was petrified. <laughs> he thought I was going to be bitten. And the adults opened up and I went in there and took pictures very, very close. And when I say very close, I could have almost touched them. And every everything was fine, no problem. And then a little girl came by and ran and the adult geese pushed the babies in the water. That was in Waltham. But I was, they do have a, literally a kindergarten. <laughs> do you wanna say anything about the turkeys? There's so many wild turkeys around our area now, or and even in walking down Brattle Street. I mean, they're just, yeah. it seems to have changed a bit from years past. Um, yeah, they're in our yard too. Um, turkeys were actually very much endangered at one point, like 50 years ago. And there were hardly any left in Massachusetts. And there was an effort to reintroduce them. And it's now been very successful. <laughs> Now, years ago, when I first came to this country, there were pheasants, wild pheasants. That <laughs> I don't see them anymore. I had not seen wild turkey, turkeys. I saw wild pheasants. I don't see the pheasants, but we're invaded by turkeys. Well, so not seeing pheasants is arguably a good thing. Um, the ring-neck pheasants that are in various parts of North America were brought over from Europe and are stocked for hunting. They are not native. And there are still places where they are raised in captivity and then released to give the hunters something to hunt. Um, I have seen them loose in Massachusetts. Um, it's been several years since I've seen one now. There used to be a group of them at Rock Meadow, actually, in Belmont. I mean, the same is true of quail. They're, they're, there are native quail in North America, but none of them would normally be found in New England. And there are places where people see um, Bob Whites and other quail, and those have all been captive raised for hunting. Mark, thank you so much. Um, I have to leave for an appointment, but it's up to others. Should we conclude this or do people have more questions? I can stay a bit longer if there are more questions. Or well, if not, well, uh, why don't we make it the formal end and then people can stay on and chat with Mark as they wish because a number of people have already dropped out. But I just wanted to remind people that our next presentation is going to be on February 9th at 11 a.m. And it's going to be John Howe talk, taking us on a tour of Mount Auburn Cemetery where I'm sure we'll see the, some of the wildlife. So it's a good... <laughs> sequel to this so yeah well mark this was absolutely wonderful and uh i am pretty sure you'll have something else for us next year with new stuff well thank you i thank you so much mark i really enjoyed this and i learned a lot I, 
I never realized there were so many different sparrows around. I have some in my backyard, but I don't know one from the other. But thank you so much. I enjoyed this so much. Right. Actually, while people are still here, so I get asked to do this about once a year, and that's fine. But it's a challenge for me to come up with what to show and a theme to tie it all together. Is there anything people want to hear that when I get asked to speak next year, I should build a talk around? Well, Mark, I love the variety that you had. The only thing um, is, I don't know whether or not you uh, observe mushrooms. Uh, uh, if you do, if you do, if you do that, but um, I actually like the flora and the fauna and, um, and the, the, the insect life. I thought it was a great a cycle to um, to observe. So thank yeah, you. I, yeah, I'm not good with plants. I so yeah, I only know a few mushrooms. I've been actually wanting to do a, a hike with the mycologist to learn more about that. Well, you amaze me with your wealth of knowledge and, and, and your recollection of all these Latin names and everything else. <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> fabulous. I wish I had that recall. I, I wish Americans didn't have this phobia of the scientific names and a lot of other parts of the world. That's how people learn things. And it makes it so much easier to learn um, what's related to what and most of the scientific names make perfect sense once you spend just a few minutes looking at them. That um, many of them are just describing features of the animal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, my mother was a biologist and uh, she taught me Shemophila umbellata, shade-loving, umbrella-shaped flower. And the plant is known commonly as wintergreen, but Shemophila, shade-loving, umbellata, umbrella-shaped flower, perfectly identifies it. Have you taken pictures of frogs? Yes. Oh, in fact, I sh that should have been in, in my year because another of the signs of spring I always look for well listen for are the spring peepers mm -hmm. and of course when wood frogs are mating then they're obvious all the rest of the year wood frogs are almost impossible to see where bullfrogs you can see in any of the warm months but yeah i have lots of frog pictures I, i'm not especially into reptiles and amphibians so when i stumble on one i'll take a picture of it but i don't generally seek them out also, so owls. People have been hearing the great horned owls wow. here in Belmont, and there's the little screech owl down on Golden and Orchard. And mm -hmm. um, I am a big fan of owls. Um, I've taken a lot of owl pictures over the years. The owls are tricky because they tend to go to the same places over and over. They're very loyal to their habitats, but Humans have a fascination with them, and it's too easy for people to disturb them and chase them away. Um, in, among the birding community, um, it's now discouraged from telling people where you've seen owls, um, because there have been a number of cases where there was an, an owl that was reliably somewhere that was easy to see, and the next thing you know, there's a crowd of 25 photographers there every afternoon waiting for it. And that, that chases the owl away and stresses them. Um, mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I, I've been lucky enough to stumble on a number of owls on my own. Um, there are some that I've heard through the grapevine where, the, where they were as well. But um, yeah, there's a number of owls that are common where people live, screech owl, great horned owl. <clears throat> Um, barred owls and a number of others less common that are around as well. Should we be concerned that you didn't include fireflies? I love fireflies. Um, they're almost impossible to photograph. Mm. Actually, I, I do have daytime photos of them. Mm. And mm -hmm. a lot of people may not even know what they look like during the day. Right. But 
the spectacle of a field full of moving pale green lights is almost impossible to photograph. I've tried. <laughs> you have to find the, the glow worms that are the larva. They yeah. don't move. <laughs> but yeah, so part of what I chose to talk about is what I had pictures of. Well, well thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you so much, thank Mark. You. Your photos right. are always spectacular. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. See you. And right. Mark, remember the uh, to ask at the beginning of our meeting before anybody came in um, about the um, uh, the web for, to be able to do a hybrid. Do you remember that for the church? They're supposed to do a oh, service. Um, yeah, I made a note on paper. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. It was great.